very warm welcome to this How To Academy event. My name is Matt Stadden. I'm a broadcaster, I'm a producer, I'm a writer, I'm a photographer, and I am totally thrilled to introduce to you a man that you know very well already, Roman Mars. And you know him because he is the host of an incredibly successful podcast, 99% Invisible. And he's also now written this book, The 99% Invisible City, a field guide to the hidden world of everyday design. I'm not going to waste any more time with the introduction because we've got so much to get through, Roman. I know lots of people will be watching this later on on the YouTube channel, the How To Academy channel. But for the moment, would you just start, please, by explaining why you chose to, as it were, transcribe elements of the podcast into book form? Well, thank you so much for having me. Well, the, the main thing was, you know, after 10 years of doing the podcast, there was something about having the worldview and the stories in 99% uh, Invisible kind of locked up in this rigid linear format. So like if you remember me at some point talking about curb cuts and how they, the origins of them and the accessibility, you have to go find that podcast, sit down for 20 minutes, you know, like listen to it, have me tell you the story. And I kind of wanted this, uh, there, there's this metaphor in the front of the book about desire paths, which is about, you know, taking the stories and information in, in the book and kind of finding your own way through it the way you would find your way through a city. And I wanted people to find their own way through the stories that we had told over the years and, and then a bunch more stories and then use the city as this jumping off point for telling these types of stories. So that, that was really the reason I, you know, I, I love design. I do a show about design. I never wanted to do a kind of deprecated rough translation of the podcast like that had no interest in me i really wanted to create its own object its own reason for existing and and, and this is like uh, like this book has a reason for existing as well as reading the book obviously i've been doing a bit of research into you and i, I haven't been able to establish the answer to this question so just let's get this out of the way from the very beginning moment <laughs> Okay. How on earth are you called Roman Mars? And are you related <laughs> to Bruno Mars or to Mars Mars? I'm related to neither. Uh, Roman is my grandfather's name. Um, and it's, it, Mars is a truncated version of our Czech name. So it's, it was Roman, like the Marachek. And, they, and they, they went by Maresic. And Mars was just a shortened version with that that I started going by a long, long time ago when I was like 15 years old. And so I've been Roman Mars ever since. Okay, this is a semi-serious question. You are one of the most successful podcast hosts in the world. Do you think that your name has helped you in that direction? <laughs> I don't think it's hurt. That's for sure. I can barely say my my uh, you know my my previous family name like without mumbling. So Roman Mars, I think, helps and it, it sticks in your brain. I think, yeah. <laughs> and tell me this: you were born in New Jersey, but spent only I think, a few months there that, on, on yeah. the East Coast. And, and, and then you've spent some time in the Rust Belt in, in Ohio, and, and now you're on, on, on the West Coast, I think in Oakland, in, in California. And I'm just curious to know whether doing what so many Americans do, and that is translocating across the country, dotting around the nation, do you think that has had an impact in the way that you see the urban space? I think so. Like, we, you know, we have a really large and heterogeneous country. And so, you know, noticing those changes um, helps you, you sort of question why things are the way they are. So like I, so my, a lot of my family is from the Southeastern United States. And so like they have, you know, thick accents and, and uh, live in rural areas. Um, I grew up a lot of, spent a lot of my time in Memphis, Tennessee. And, and the two places that I think I hail from the most are probably Memphis, Tennessee and, and Central Ohio. And like in Memphis, for example, that they have their, their roads downtown are, use a lot of this brown mud from the Mississippi to make the aggregate, to make the cement. And I remember going back there recently after being on the West Coast for, you know, for 10 or 20 years and going back to Memphis and saying, have you ever wondered why the roads are brown? And uh, everyone in Memphis, I asked, were like, the roads are brown? You know, they were like, they didn't even notice. And, um, and it was just one of those things, like, when you move around, you are aware of these little differences and little changes. And that's one of the things about the, the whole concept of 99% invisible is that these things are invisible because they're so every day, because they function in a way that we're not supposed to notice them. And so when you move around, you, you all of a sudden you're solipsistic and narcissistic sort of self that just thinks that the world is the way it is because that's the way you entered into it. All of a sudden you notice those changes and then 
you can react to them. And I think it does make you a little bit of a, you know, if you're a tourist in your own country, you begin to notice these little differences pretty well. Well, that's sort of my next question, Elaine. I mean, that, that's so clever that you get us to open our eyes to the things that we don't normally recognize. So much do we take for granted. And, and I just wonder, because I re- it takes me back to an, an ex-girlfriend many years ago, who was very disappointed when I told her, I think, that the set of one of our big soap operas didn't have ceilings. <laughs> I, I went there when I was a, a BBC journalist. I went to have a look around. And she didn't want to know this. She, she wanted to sort of stay in, in that make-believe world. She wanted her belief to continue to be suspended. Mm-hmm. Do you think it helps us to notice these things? Or do you think we would prefer to see the world without seeing it, as it were? Obviously, we enjoy the podcast, we enjoy the book, and we like mm-hmm. the idea of seeing things that we don't normally see. But has it improved your appreciation of your, of, of your surroundings? Oh, for sure. I mean, so I think that if you're trying to create a facade, then exploring the fakeness of that facade, it might you know, ruin the magic a little bit. But if the world seems like a, you know, everyday humdrum thing, you know, burrowing down to find cool hidden stories and little bits of genius um, just makes it more delightful. And so the, you know, as I was doing the show, what I've noticed over time is that I, I'm not sort of wired to be a, you know, a, a, a optimistic person. Like it's just not, not in my nature, but as I sort of see, you know, all these design elements in the world, where people are thinking about um, how I operate in the city and, uh, and how um, they've solved problems for me before I know I have them. I actually feel kind of like the warm embrace of the world in some ways, just through these hard objects. And so I think it's, uh, I think it's grand to know the stories everywhere. Like it really helps me out. And it also helps me navigate the world. Like if, I'm, if I talk about infrastructure and cities and bridges and I love beautiful bridges and I love these things that we all like get together and achieve these grand you know like constructions if I love those things but I happen to be like in my car and like tapping on my dashboard because somebody's stopping me because they're constructing it and it's it's interrupting my day like you know maybe if I truly love those things I said chill the hell out and just like sit there and recognize that somebody's doing something for me and I should just like relax into it and so it kind of helps me navigate the world a little bit more with a little bit more empathy when I appreciate the world around me. So the beauty rather than the devil is in the detail. We'll, we'll get into the nitty gritty of the detail. And by the way, I wrote a book myself last year, as I was saying before we went live, and it's called How to See Birds. And the whole principle of it is that even if we live in an inner city, there is beauty on our doorstep. For sure. There's bird life, there's nature on our doorstep. And during the pandemic and the lockdowns, I've taken a huge amount of comfort and pleasure in that. And, and you're doing kind of a, a, a similar thing, aren't you, by opening our eyes? Yeah, that's the idea. I mean, we didn't design this book to come out in a time period where there was a gigantic pandemic and people can't travel. But in a way, it's sort of become the perfect travel guide for now, which is, you know, recognizing the beauty and the cool things that are in your city. I mean, the joke of the book is like, a, it's like the travel, it's like the field guide to a city, which is like, you know, you're going to a city, well, here's the field guide, you know, like it's sort of ridiculous. But the, the point is, is that you will find analogs um, in the book to things that are around you. And we might tell what we think is the most interesting story, like the, the tra- you know, you'll see a traffic light and we'll tell you about the traffic, traffic light in Syracuse, New York, or, you know, you look at your city grid and we, you know, we talk about the Eschampas of Barcelona, you know, we use the, the, the moment that we're in, you know, the, the, the place that we're in to travel around the world and, and find beauty where you are. And, and I think that's a kind of an important thing right now when we can't go to all these cool places, uh, you know, ourselves. Think, think back to coming out of a, a quite early self-isolation period that I did myself back in in March and going back into work at LBC where I was a a presenter and going into the centre of town and just being struck at 9.30 on a Friday evening by how completely empty it was. Yeah. And I wonder whether you have noticed dramatic changes in the urban landscapes where you live as a direct result of this pandemic. I mean, you you wrote the book before the pandemic, Mm -hmm. but maybe you would have written a slightly different book had you been writing now. 
Yeah, well, the immediate stuff that happened that I was interested in was the sort of like um, the soft architecture that cropped up, the kind of uh, tape on the floor that separated us, um, which evolved into kind of fancy design decals, which, you know, have footprints on them and say, you know, like, please stand back six feet or something like that. Those are actually kind of like, I, you know, like I've, I've always kind of felt that the floor was a, a wasted space and there could be some information on there to guide us around. I, you know, and I like, I, I like the order of us all, like, like there's a trope in movies that when it comes to crisis, um, we all freak out and turn on each other. And it, it, that's not the case, like empirically when it comes to crisis. Epidemics are kind of a strange type of crisis, which violate this rule somewhat. But for the most part, we, we do behave orderly and we do behave with some degree of altruism. And, and, and so watching people be, you know, wait in line and be ordered and try to live their lives and stuff. And I, I found some hope in that. Like, I liked that. Um, um, and then there were other things I didn't like. You know, I, I didn't like the, the plexiglass kind of like that. I was, I was shocked to find all the places you could affix plexiglass to. Like, it, it was kind of cropped up immediately. Like, if I owned a store, I wouldn't even know where to buy plexiglass. And it was like put up all over uh, between a person, you know, register and, and a and a person checking out. And, um, and I find it hard because even with the masks and everything, it's hard to hear people and understand. Uh, and so I found that a little bit distancing and, and, and off-putting, but those, you know, that showed up right away. But I think one of the other parts about the, the cityscape in general was, you know, like in the US in particular, you know, we've given over roads uh, to cars. A uh, hundred years ago, we just decided that roads were for cars and that was it. And roads were not invented to be just for cars. I mean, roads a hundred years ago had people on them. They had horses on them. They had trolley lines on them. They had cars. They had vendors that sat in the middle of them. They were a much more chaotic and free-for-all place that people figured out, you know, ways to operate. And it was, yes, it had its dangers, but for the most part, it, it you know, it kind of functioned. And then a car came and then it knocked everything off, else off of a road and everything was designed around a car. And when we have this moment where we want to be together, but we need to be outside and we need to be distanced from each other. A lot of cities here are experimenting with outside spaces and outside cafes and they're taking over the roads again. And, and, and I love to see that kind of experimentation. And, and when you see a city um, taking the moment to like really reassess its, like, it, like there are cities, especially out West that are completely designed around a car and to take this moment to reassess you know, its values as a city and how it best serves its citizens um, to close down streets and try to put sidewalk cafes. It's been really interesting to watch that. And I don't know how it's all going to unfold. I don't know if it's going to be temporary. I, but I have a feeling that people, like once you like take this rigid framework and you kind of break it out a little bit, you try it once, that people are going to be more experimental in the future when it comes to their cities. And I'm, I'm, I'm curious to watch it. But yeah, I, I had no idea. I, I still think that the, the book is kind of an interesting moment for now because knowing how we got to now and knowing the evolution of it kind of prepares you for the changes that are coming. Um, but, um, but yeah, it's been interesting to watch the city be so, be so dynamic in this moment when we're talking about it. Space, and you've mentioned that several times already, is such a big, obviously, an important part of the book. And, and where there's space, there's contests, there's competition. So local roads here, for example, I think, have been the subject of, of change or attempts to change, taking cars out of it, making it into a play road and, and so forth. And a huge amount of controversy can spring up ar around contested space. And, and in the book, you talk just, for example, about guerrilla activists or those, I think it might have been in San Francisco, who residents who put boulders on the sidewalk, on, on, on the pavement, in, in order to discourage criminals, drug dealers, and so forth. So where there's space in a city, almost by definition, there's often competition and contest and, and controversy. Yeah. I mean, what I like, the whole, the whole book sort of builds to this last chapter, which is about urbanism and the, the really the conversation that we have that is the thing that actually determines what a city is. So it's the, it's both the top down design of the city and the bottom up interventions that sort of create the conversation with what a city really is. And so I'm fascinated by this in particular, it's become sort of a central point of, of the show in, in a lot of ways. And, 
and yeah, there's a, you know, like you cannot make a city perfect for every person. And it's not that designers are dumb or that they're cruel. They just can't anticipate what is going to happen. And so it is, I, I think that the book is a little bit of this permission to push back on the city and kind of make it what it could be for you. And, and some of those ways are extremely selfish and horrible. I mean, those boulders in San Francisco were to stop people from, you know, kind of rough sleeping on, on the sidewalk there. And, um, and then they pushed them out in the street and the city put them back on the sidewalk. And, and, um, and then finally somebody took them all away. And, and, and it was one of those things that was like, I get the point. There's something needs to be fixed, but this is probably not the way to fix it. And, and so there's a, there, there was a, there was an instance where in, in, uh, uh, we, we, we interviewed this, this fellow talking about this, this, these types of, you know, DIY urbanism and, you know, there's ways to do this. That's where, where like, if there's, he noticed that at his, at his bus stop, there was a lot of trash that was collecting in, in the, in the bin. And so he took away the bus stop sign, you know, just so that people wouldn't gather there. And, and it was like, it's a horribly selfish act. So like, you can do, you know, like I, I, I sometimes we get, uh, people get on our case and we get like, um, that, <laughs> that people like are, we, we just champion people doing cool things because there's great ones. You know, those people were like, they redesign parking signs to make them, you know, like understandable or, you know, or someone like puts a new highway sign out to, to make it so that people don't miss their, their turn. And for the most part, we just, we, we kind of laugh at them and we think they're pretty fun and stuff like this. But there's, they're just cities, these interventions are just like people. Some of them are like completely thoughtless and, and, and just self-interested and some of them are for everybody. And it's just, to me, I just love to document them all because I think they're, they just show like some kind of initiative and show what cities are all about, which is really, is it's about that conversation of pushing back and forth about what space means and, and how it can be, you know, how it can serve different, different people. And you're interested in, in the micro, but, but you don't ignore the macro and, and the way that cities develop and progress is so fascinating, isn't it? You, you take Islamabad, for example, I was there in 97, which was a, a very modern city, certainly back then. And it was designed in a, in a, in a very sort of predestined, very planned way. And then you get other cities that are much more higgledy piggledy and that grow much more organically. And, and then you get cities that are designed, but then take a life of their own on, thank, thanks to their residents and, and that conversation that you've spoken about between those who are in authority and those who actually live there. And it's just such an interesting area. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's so rich that we, we talk about it in some way, probably the most of anything, because, you know, the reason why the show, like we don't, we, you know, we cover design in a very specific way. Like, well, I don't cover design as if they're, like they're the new solution that's going to solve a thing, um, the brand new material or building or even device or something that is going to make things all be better. We, we're just a stealth history show. We talk about the design of things um, at a certain point and then go, well, what did, what did, because we're interested in the reaction. We're interested in the thing that happened. And so the reaction is, is, the, is the fun part, like how we interact with, with these things that we, we've decided that these were our values at a certain point and now this is how we're going to live with them now. Uh, that is what, that's, that's the human drama. That's fun, you know. It's interesting because I heard a noise in the background there. <laughs> and it just, it, it, it reminds me of the, the many different thoughts that your book provokes. And, and I suppose that's in a way the point of it, to make us, as we've been discussing, reimagine our surroundings and ask ourselves questions of our surroundings that we wouldn't normally. And I've just written down a few words here that you provoked in me as I was reading. So highways, seaside, the way the, the coast might interact with a city, power, who runs the place, to mm -hmm. what extent is there people power, what role do, do activists play, change, the skyline, adapting, how do we adapt as city dwellers, statues and memorials, huge of course in the context of the Black Lives Matter movement, and then green, Gardens, mm -hmm. space, a word that we've already used, heat, snow, the environment, the weather changes. How does the weather affect? You talk in the book about how we sweltered a couple of years back 
in, a, in a, an extended heat wave here in London and the effect that that has on us. So w what does unusual weather ha have, have as an effect on us, but also then more expected weather? And how does that change the anatomy of the city? If you're expecting it to be boiling hot, you have, you have cooling systems, aircon in America. We barely have any aircon in any of our residences in this country. Mm -hmm. There are parks and trees and water. You talk a lot about water and the underground systems. I remember being in Istanbul and seeing the way the old waterworks used to, used, used to be, and you can still see them there. And you talk about fishing on, underground in, in, in Manhattan. Mm -hmm. And then graveyards. How do we deal with the dead? How do we deal with our history? How do we deal with change? But how, how do we deal with preservation? How do we deal with deliberately preserving something in a form that it wasn't originally in? Use as an example with Statue of Liberty. I mean, I could go on. There are so many technology, Wi-Fi, things that are integral to how we live our lives that we don't necessarily think about. How do animals fit into city? What about our culture, our sport, art, festivals? How do we celebrate our space? The people, underground, mm -hmm. the government, bureaucracy, dirt, and so forth. I mean, what you do, basically, Roman, is make us think about things that we just take for granted. Yeah, because I think that they, those things reflect our values and it's good to examine them through the things we make. I mean, these are the permanent artifacts of our values. And so I find them endlessly fascinating for that reason. And sometimes they're not really examined those ways. I mean, a lot of people do a good job examining them those ways. I'm not like the pioneer of this in any way, shape or form. But what I love is, you know, like I, before, you know, I really was thinking about this stuff and I was thinking about, for example, preservation, you know, of old things, you know, that's a very conscious effort here because we have a much newer country. And, but I was, um, I, one of my favorite places on earth is uh, Stirling. My friend, one of my best friend lives in Stirling, Scotland, and I just like to go visit him and I have a great time there. And I'm, I was fascinated by Stirling Castle because it's bright yellow, you know, <laughs> like, and that was a conscious choice to preserve it um, in the way of its glory, you know, and the populace of Sterling who grew up with it being gray, mostly like repurposed army barracks, you know, um, uh, freaked out <laughs> when it turned yellow, you know, like, and, but and it makes you realize when you make a bold choice like that, what an active choice preservation is, because most of us, I, I had never really thought about choosing the moment of preservation and what those, how that reflected our values. And so I, I find that stuff endlessly fascinating. You know, like I just love people, um, how the things that they make is a window into who they are as humans. Um, and so, yeah, I, it, it's, it's really what drives the show. Give us 